Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. Um, today I'm going to talk about the period of British politics around 1916, when uh, halfway through the First World War, um, Herbert Asquith is replaced by David Lloyd George with the, the kind of the assistance and connivance of Winston Churchill. Um, and really, what's going on at that time? Why does Britain ch- um, have this kind of change of, of leadership half, halfway through the war. I guess it's kind of topical at the moment um, in uh, Great Britain particularly as we are um, almost expecting uh, Prime Ministers now to last uh, a matter of, uh, of months, in some cases obviously weeks. Um, but the thing about Asquith is that he'd had he'd been in in power for approximately 10 years at at this point as as prime minister um overcoming enormous uh constitutional crises with the house of lords and the people's budget um and and managing to steer through some of the most successful social reforms of the uh, of, of the era uh uh, match, you know, almost sort of rivaling the post Second World War Labour government. So he wasn't this sort of uh, kind of rootless incompetent that we've been cursed with recently. In, in fact, far from it. He is this kind of um, you know, titan of liberal politics. However, the First World War seems to change all that. So we're looking at um, an excellent biography of Winston Churchill. Um, this is a kind of, not so much a biography as a kind of a critical reading of um, the, the the cult of Churchill, which seems to kind of grip the nation. Uh, and it's Geoffrey Wheatcroft's uh, book uh, in Chur- uh, Churchill's Shadow: An Astonishing Life and a Dangerous Legacy. Um, and so here is where we begin. Geoffrey Wheatcroft writes, By December 1916, discontent with Asquith's inert conduct of the war allowed Lloyd George to outplay him and replace him as Prime Minister with the support of press magnates, notably Lord Northcliffe and Max Aitken, who would be rewarded for following uh, the following year by being made Lord Beaverbrook. Beaverbrook, of course, is a lifelong friend of Churchill's, became uh, Churchill's Minister of Aircraft Supply in 1940, um, and it's really interesting to observe, uh, you know, over a century ago, still the importance uh, and the significance and the political power of press barons, and you know, the uh, this this has only kind of accentuated here in the twenty first century, as we are seem to be a, a kind of a quasi democracy run by media magnates. Anyway. Lloyd George wanted to bring Churchill back into government, partly because he needed um, his dynamism, partly from a flicker of guilt to the limited extent that Lloyd George ever felt that, after abandoning him, obviously, um, after the failure of Gallipoli, Churchill as First Lord of the Admiralty was hung out to dry, Um, it wasn't all his fault, but it certainly wasn't blameless either. Um, and partly on the principle later expressed with Texan bluntness by Linda Johnson. With a certain kind of man, you'd rather have him on the inside pissing out than on the outside pissing in. When Lloyd George made just that point, in Welsh Baptist rather than Texan, to Andrew Bonner Law, would it not be better to have Churchill with us than against us? Bonner Law replied, I'd rather have him against us every time. So, again, I mean, Churchill, who had crossed benches, who had um, been uh, a, uh, a a conservative, then a liberal, um, and then would switch back to the Conservative Party uh, later on, throughout most of his career was widely mistrusted, seen as uh, a sort of... Um, unreliable, unpredictable and untrustworthy political ally um, I mean I suppose part of the kind of the um, part of the way in which uh, for example the likes of Boris Johnson have modelled themselves on Winston Churchill in recent years which I mean he, I would say th- 
he hasn't really, um, or you know, he likes to kind of cite Churchill as a, as a reference point, but doesn't everybody, um, was to look at um, Churchill's personal failings and the, the fact that Churchill was able to kind of politically triumph from the end in spite of his personal failings. I suppose if you are kind of uh, someone who uh, accumulates personal and political failings, um, like parking tickets, then this is a kind of an attractive fantasy to buy into. Now the dissonance was louder than ever between Churchill's indomitable self-belief and the sheer dislike and distrust he inspired. By his early 40s, he'd acquired two reputations, as a reckless and unstable adventurer and as an unprincipled self-seeking opportunist. These are more striking because they would seem to be mutually exclusive, but they help to explain why, for a man of his fame and his gifts, Churchill enjoyed so little political support. His Tory foes at the time conceded his courage, energy and brilliance, Lloyd George much later wrote, but they asked why, in spite of all that, although he had many admirers, he had few followers, than, fewer followers than any prominent man in Britain. Churchill had never attracted and had never certainly retained the affection of any section, province or town. And he was, uh, and the answer was not far to seek, Lloyd George thought. His mind was a powerful machine, but there lay hidden in its material or makeup some obscure defect which prevented it from always running true. Given that Churchill's tendency to think in terms of race, it's ironic that there were some, including Asquith, who wondered whether um, that erratic temperament came from Mexican or indigenous American blood on his mother's side. Um, but Asquith's wife, Margot, saw, uh, saw more clearly. That silly, snobbish, but clever woman liked Churchill. But apart from thinking that his vanity is septic, she mused about what gives Winston his preeminence. It is certainly not his mind. I said long ago, and with truth, Winston has a very noisy mind. Certainly not his judgment. He is constantly very wrong indeed. And of course, it is his um, of course it is his courage and his colour, his amazing mixture of industry and enterprise. Poor Winston. His political position is nil. So, yeah, here you have somebody who is a strange mixture of ambition um, and uh, an ability to um, betray others. Um, and an ability to uh, demonstrate ap appalling judgment. Later on, I mean, what, one of the, the, the great sort of failings of the movie uh, The King's Speech is that it portrays Winston Churchill as the sort of the, uh, the mentor to the, the kind of the John of Gaunt figure to um, George VI and in fact the opposite was true Winston Churchill uh, was renowned for coming into Parliament roaring drunk demanding that there be a King's Party established during the abdication crisis of Edward VIII and the King's Party's sole purpose would be to support Edward against the government this was seen as catastrophically bad judgment, and it had very little to do with not with Edward's imagined Nazi sympathies. Um, there were uh, abundant fascist sympathies amongst amongst Britain's upper classes. It wasn't a particularly um, novel position to take. Um, what what seemed to be the case is that um, Britain, a, uh, in 1936, a largely socially conservative country, um, uh, one where the uh, you know we've we've been through decades of uh, royal scandals and divorces and things like that, but the idea of the king um, marrying an American divorcee was really really quite quite shocking. Um, and that this is a point at which the, the royal family uh, in the interwar period still has to carry a significant amount of moral authority, significantly more than it, it needs to, to carry now. Um, so that, that, that really is, is the, the essence of, of the, the divorce crisis and Winston Churchill's kind of crass and um, poorly judged 
contribution to it certainly gained him no friends and certainly in, in about the same era his views on uh, the future of, of, of India um, were even to imperialists wildly unrealistic so Churchill has has this, this track record for making the, the wrong calls um, but he only had to make the right call once which was of course in in May 1940 so Geoffrey Wheatcroft writes about Churchill all the same through all his setbacks Churchill never lost his reverence for constitutional parliamentary government he briefed Alexander McCullum Scott a backbench liberal who had written a sympathetic biography of Churchill in 1905 when he was only 30 Scott recorded a moment he had shared with Churchill in March 1917 as we are leaving the house late tonight, he called me back into the chamber to take a last look around. All was darkness except the ring uh, of, um, of faint light around, the, um, around under the gallery. We could dimly see the table, but walls and roofs were invisible. Look at it, he said. This little place is what makes the difference between us and Germany. It is in virtue of this that we shall muddle through and, and uh, to success. And for the lack of this, Germany's brilliant efficiency leads her to financial dis- to final disaster. This little room is a shrine to the, of the world's liberties. Those were fine words, especially at a time when the little room wasn't listening to Churchill, writes Geoffrey Wheatcroft. He did return to the go- uh, to government in July 1917. But before then, the course of the war had changed dramatically. The February Revolution in Russia had overthrown the Tsar. A new democratic government was still committed to the war, but half-heartedly. And Russian people uh, were even less enthusiastic. If Russia fell out of the war, the German army on the Western Front could be hugely reinforced from the East. But if Entente was uh, was going to lose um, one ally... If the Entente was going to lose one ally, I beg your pardon, uh, another arrived... When the European war broke out in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson had been in the White House for only 17 months, which had been wholly preoccupied with domestic reform, and neither he nor the most Americans wanted to enter the distant conflict. A few Anglophile New England Republicans, like Wilson's great antagonist, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge from Massachusetts, favoured joining the British side, but they were in a small minority. In England particularly, Churchill would later obtusely write, where laws and language seem to make a bridge of mutual comprehension between the two nations, no one could understand why American entry into the war took so long. He claimed, without evidence, that Wilson underestimated American feeling in favour of the Allies, and that what Wilson did by entering the war in April 1917 could have been done in May 1915. And if done then... Um, what abridgment of the slaughter, what sparing of the agony, what ruin, what catastrophes would have been prevented? In how many million homes would an empty chair be occupied today? How different would be the shattered world in which victors and vanquished alike are condemned to live? So this is obviously you know Churchill's um, way of, of, of viewing the world and viewing the war. Um, and Jeffrey Wheatcroft argues that this is kind of wholly unrealistic and a kind of a, a real, real misunderstanding of American politics uh, and of um, uh, America at, at the time. Um, he writes, The country had been peopled by migrants escaping from Europe and its conflicts, notably from military conscription. Not only did most Americans want to keep out of the war when it began, Good contemporary judges reckon that had the United States been obliged to take sides, then more Americans would have preferred to fight against the Anglo-Russian, uh, at the Anglo-French-Russian Entente than for it. Millions of Irish Americans had no wish to fight for the King of England. Um, millions of Jewish Americans had no wish to fight fight for the Tsars of Russia, whose oppression they had fled and tens of millions of German Americans had no wish to fight against their ancestral homeland. Even Wilson himself worried when the fighting began that he might have to go to war against England. He identified with James Madison, the only other Princeton man to have reached the White House, and memories of the British blockade which lay behind the 1812 war made him think that another blockade, 
an essential part of British strategy against Germany now, as it had been months against France, might be the cause of war again. By May 1915, Churchill intended this, um, um, uh, the sinking of the Lusitania, a liner carrying munitions as well as passengers, um, 1,198 of, out of the 1,959 passengers and crew aboard the ship drowned, and uh, the dead included 128 Americans. A persistent conspiracy theory holds that Churchill somehow deliberately dis uh, directed the ship into the path of U-boats to provoke an American reaction. In plain terms, that's false. But Churchill did most incautiously write to Walter, Runs Walter Runciman, the president of the Board of Trade, that it is most important to attract neutral shipping to our shores, in the hope especially of embroiling the United States with Germany. We want the traffic, the more the better. And if some of it gets into trouble, better still, which was by any standards heartlessly cynical enough. So, I guess one one of the important things to um, to remember when we have this kind of Titanic figure of Winston Churchill, who has been you know in Great Britain raised to a, a a point of almost kind of national reverence you know he's a, a figure around which particularly in the last 20 years almost kind of slightly secular religion has been uh, has been founded and the uh, certainly there, there's almost a kind of a a, a, a secular worship of uh, the, 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 the two world wars we have to see him as a, a kind of um a, a realistic historical figure you know, as, a, as a human being um, certainly his detractors on the the left decry Churchill's uh, imperialism and bigotry and racism and if you look at the rhetoric that Churchill comes out with during the Second World War particularly when it comes to the question of India he says some absolutely dreadful things and uh, and you know takes some um, very racist positions um the the real the real Churchill, just like the real anybody, exists as a kind of slightly unknowable character somewhere in, in, in the middle. Um the but you know, part of the, the kind of the, the adoration of, of of Churchill is based in, in the realisation that he had his flaws and that he drank too much and smoked cigars and made um, outlandish off the top of his head decisions uh, and and the the appeal is that you know as a result of this he's kind of he, he sort of somehow triumphed anyway and it it it, um, it, it is is part of kind of a, a British rejection of uh, experts intellectualism and technocrats that you know the uh, an aristocratic bluffer can do it and that's what this country's all about well you know that that's to ignore the fact that the the aristocratic bluffer in question as we've seen was quite a quite a cynical calculating figure in both world wars he knew that the answer was to draw america in um and to rely on american support and he was in, in you know insistent that that that, that happen um, there's a great deal to be said about Churchill's um, negotiations with Roosevelt uh, during the Second World War. Churchill was very keen to make sure that supplies of munitions uh, and other equipment got to Great Britain, but less keen to allow um, the uh, the power of, of 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 American sort of hard and soft power to start supplanting uh, the British Empire, and he was a very very kind of canny negotiator at the Arcadia Conference in 1941 um, to prevent um, any concessions on um, er eroding um, the the uh, uh, currency and tariff walls around the British Empire. Although many Americans, writes Jeffrey Wheatcroft, were shocked by the Lusitania, there's still, uh, there was still a very strong anti-war movement. He kept us out of the war was the slogan on which Wilson was re-elected in 1916. And he might have kept them out but for the arrogant German, uh, but for arrogant German folly. By proclaiming uh, openly a campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare and by secretly, but not secretly enough, urging Mexico to attack its northern neighbour, Germany finally provoked Wilson in April 1917 to proclaim that a state of war existed. 
In those distant days when Congress had not supinely surrendered its fundamental constitutional rights to declare war, Wilson's request was debated at length on Capitol Hill for a, uh, before a declaration of war was passed on uh, the 6th of April. Though far, um, though far from unanimously, 82 to 6 in the Senate and 373 to 50 in the House. This decision was um, followed by uh, the disastrous 1917 Nivelle Offensive, um, which was uh, resulted in mutinies in the French army, which uh, General Robert Nivelle uh, crushed um, with firing squads. And the, the offensive led um, Churchill in the House to say, well, you know, we, we need to call an end to offensives with it just throw men into the meat grinder and stop all that and wait for the americans to come you really just sit tight and wait for millions and millions and millions of american soldiers to um land uh, and and to get ready the americans weren't really ready for about nine or ten months um the the army of General John Pershing was only really uh, able to um, get into any any meaningful kind of combat shape in about the spring of 1918, and so it, it was a, um, a a long waiting game. Churchill, by this um, by the summer of 1917, had been exonerated by the the Dardanelles inquiry into the disaster of Gallipoli. And that meant that Lloyd George could bring him back into into government. And remember, you've got this character that Lloyd George kind of liked. You know, the extent to which Lloyd George really had friends is is debatable. But they they were kind of political allies and contemporaries. Um, uh, but Lloyd George also saw him as a a kind of a liability, somebody who you couldn't trust not to be in government with. Um, so, but Churchill would have a kind of like a, a variety over the next few years of sort of portfolio positions and uh, of ministerial portfolios. Um, and he would be a, um, uh, somebody who would hold most of the great offices of state, um, long before his um his prime ministerial career began and then you know in between time there this long period of 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 political wilderness so winston churchill is is this this curious figure um during the first world war of both somebody who if you look objectively at the, at his his resume um should have had very little role in anything at all. His 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 time as First Lord of the Admiralty is is one that is punctuated by failure. Um, he seems to be out of step with what most of the generals and certainly what the Prime Minister is saying. He has um, uh, political enemies in both parties, and he's seen as kind of unreliable and and untrustworthy. Um, he is in in many ways the complete opposite of, of Herbert Asquith, who Asquith's um, running of the war again is a, quite a strange affair. He's uh, kind of lackluster and, and disinterested, um, and seemingly kind of un, unable to attend uh, war cabinet meetings, um, and. His part of the reason here is perhaps uh, Asquith's temperament of um, his belief in uh, in um, liberal values of, of of individual liberty that kind of came uh, that that stood in contrast to things like the Defence of the Realm Act, conscription, and the growth of the states, which you know the size of the state explodes during the First World War. Um, and this is partly to do with his reluctance to introduce conscription, which was the wedge issue that Lloyd George and the, the press barons used to remove um, remove Asquith. So interesting and contrasting characters, Churchill, Asquith and, and, and Lloyd George. Um, there we'll finish things. I hope you find this useful. Um, and um, I'm 
doing a few li- uh, a few little shorts on on YouTube at the moment uh, for students. Um, we're just going to do a few things on the on the New Deal, and I'll be doing another study extra pretty soon on um, Stalin and the the power struggle to succeed Lenin. Thanks very much. Take good care. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you.